This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth of the second channel, War on Disinformation. This is another reading today on the 14th of May, a Sunday, of the book History of the Inquisition from Philip from Limborg. We already have, as you know from the last reading, reached Volume 2 and are getting now much, much deeper into the persecution and the Inquisition as we have done in the in uh, in the previous readings uh, of Volume 1, which was also interesting, of course. So, without any further ado, let's uh, continue here on the page 16 in the book, and that is 184 in the PDF, if you read along. Uh, chapter 4, the Aryan persecutions of the Orthodox. It's going to be interesting to learn what or who the Aryans are and without taking anything away that you didn't know yet um, when you followed uh, characteristics of the Antichrist or other videos of me you know that the Aryan people were people like the Vandals with their uh, capital city Carthage in North Africa and they have been heavily persecuted and they are the Vandals one of the three nations one of the three kingdoms that were plucked up by the roots by the Antichrist before the Antichrist came into working between the fall of the Roman pagan empire and the erection of the papal Roman empire. There were three nations plucked out by the roots as uh, predicted in uh, Revelation and those were the Vandals, the Ostrogoths and the Heruli. And, um, at least the Vandals, as far as I am know, I think the others too, were so-called Aryans. So we are talking about these Aryans. So, let's get to the reading. 
But neither did the Aryans, when they had an emperor of their own party, refrain from any sort of cruelty, but persecuted those by whom they had been deprived with a more implacable and bloody hatred. So this is nothing else than payback. Huh? In the Bible it is stated, Venge Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. But here the people take the vengeance of themselves. They have been persecuted, okay. That is bad, like everybody who has been persecuted, that is bad. But therefore you don't take the sword into your own hand. They did that. Now the persecutions against Athanasius, their principal adversary, are notorious to all. Athanasius himself, in his letter to the Hermites, gives us many uh, instances of their cruelty, which is the burden of this epistle. So this is all about the writings of Athanasius that we are reading right now, that is to come here. And aggravated as far as words can do it, meaning that they scorched the bishops in Egypt and bound them with cruel change. chains. sorry, <laughs> That they sent Sarapamo into banishment and beat Potemo in so barbarous a manner on his back that he was left for dead and died soon after of his bruises and pain. That they would not suffer a dead woman to be buried. I don't get the sentence, uh, so... Ah, yeah, okay, that they would not suffer a dead woman to be buried, but lay, uh, let them lay out on the streets. Yeah, That they ejected many bishops from their, from their sees and sent them into banishment, and that they obtained an edict from the emperor that the bishops should not, uh, should not only be banished from the cities and the churches, but even punished with death wherever they could be found. And he adds, and now follows a lengthy quote, quote, that so dreadfully were men terrified by them, that some pretended to believe their heresies, and others, through fear, chose rather to fly into deserts than fall into their hands. And in another place he says, how many bishops were brought before governors and kings, and heard this sentence from their judges, either subscribe or depart from your churches. For the emperor hath commanded you should be banished from your churches. How many in every city scattered themselves up and down for fear of being accused as the bishop's friends? For the magistrates were written to and commanded upon penalty uh, of, of a, uh, upon penalty of a fine to compel the bishops of their respective cities to subscribe. In fine, all places and cities were filled with terrors and tumults, for violence was offered to the bishops, and the judges saw the mournings and sighs of the people. And at length, after a tragical account of the various cruelties and persecutions of the Arians, Athanasius adds that they would not suffer be friends of those they had slain to bury their dead bodies, but hid them in private places, that thereby they might conceal their murders. There are other passages to the same purpose in the same epistle. In his first apology also for his flight, <coughs> he speaks of the same purpose and among other things related that Sebastianus, captain of the forces at the instigation of George the bishop, ordered virgins to be brought in a flaming pile and violently compelled them by fire to declare their profession of the Arian faith. And when he perceived their courage was not to be thus subdued, he stripped their bodies naked and so mangled their faces with, bows, with blows that it was a long while before their own relations knew them again. He also apprehended forty men and miserably tore their bodies by a new method of cruelty, for, be made <coughs> for he made rods of the palm tree, retaining their prickles, and with these beat them on their backs in such a barbarous manner that some, by reason of the prickles sticking in their flesh, were forced several times to apply to the physicians for a cure, whilst others actually died under the torture. As for the others, as many as they uh, apprehended, they banished them with the virgins into great oasis, a country in Egypt. End quote from Athanasius. 
and that they might have some pretext to palliate their persecutions. Victor, in his account of the persecutions of the Vandals, tells us that the, law, that the very laws made by the Catholics against heretical impiety were now turned and executed upon the Catholics themselves, so that what they once suffered from the Catholics, they made the Catholics to suffer in their turn. Now they had got the secular power on their side. Lucius, an Arian bishop, besides the slaughters, torments, banishments, hangings, burnings, and other innumerable cruelties he exercised on the Catholics, laid waste the monasteries and caves of the monks. Almost the same things are related to Severus, bishop of Antioch. Victor, in his first book of the Vandal Persecution, says that being infected with the Her Arian heresy, they filled every place with fire and slaughter, and burned and demolished the churches, temples and monasteries, and tortured the bishops and priests with various kinds of cruelties, to force them to deliver up all the gold and silver they had of their own, or that belonged to their churches. And if they gave them any, they put them to yet more exquisite tortures, to force them to deliver up the whole, as imagining they had concealed a part from them. They deprived the Catholics up and down of their churches and commanded them to be shut up. The same victor recounts the various sorts of cruelties wherewith the Arians persecuted the Catholics, meaning that in Africa they were, by the Vandals, first deprived of their churches and houses, then driven without the city walls, without creature, weapon or clothes. And yet farther, by a public edict, it was commanded that no one should entertain or feed them. And if any one out of compassion did this, he was burned with his entire family. This is exactly what later happens during the Inquisition term. Exactly the same thing. When you are helping, sustaining, in any way aiding a quote-unquote heretic, you were a heretic yourself and you and your family were persecuted too. That's a fact. And we're going to read about that later in this book, I guess. Now, Huneric, the Aryan king of the Vandals in Africa, among other cruelties, he exercised on the Catholics, through an immense multitude of them, one upon another, like heaps of locusts into, stra into straight and vile places, where they had no conveniency or for easing nature, but were forced to do it amongst one another as they lay, so that the stench and terror exceeded all other kinds of punishments. Victor relates these, th uh, relates these things, who himself was an eyewitness to them. So we have an eyewitness account of Victor. The same Victor relates other kinds of cruelty practiced by Euneric, but it would be too tedious to recount them all. It is enough to add that some had their tongues cut out, others their hands, others their feet chopped off, others their eyes dug out, and others were miserably slain through the extremity of their tortures. And he gives another reference where we can look that up. Austin also, in his 50th epistle to Boniface, and in the 68th epistle in other books, which he wrote against the Donatists, recounts uh, the various cruelties of the Donatists and Circumcilians, so that the Christians seemed only to be employed in mutual butcherings of one another, and acted as though the whole persecution of the Christian life consisted, not in the in the holiness of their matters, but in a bitter and imprudent zeal. So that Amanius Marcellinus, a heathen writer, describing those times, relates of Julian the Emperor uh, in chapter 22, that he ordered the Christian bishops and people that were at variance with each other to come into his palace and there admonish them that they should that they should every one profess his own religion without hindrance or fear, whilst they did no dis uh, whilst they did not disturb the public peace by their divisions, which he did for this reason, because as he knew their liberty would increase their divisions, he might 
uh, he might now have nothing to fear from their being an united people, having found by experience that even beasts were not so cruel to men as the generality of Christians are to each other. Having found by experience that even beasts are not so cruel to men as the generality of Christians are to each other. Beasts are not cruel to men. Animals don't know cruelty. They just attack because of certain reasons. But they are not cruel. Men are cruel. The ecclesiastical doctors give very pathetic and odious descriptions of the persecutions of the Arians. It is abundantly plain from the writings of the Orthodox, which now remain, that their edicts were far from being vain and harmless terrors. And if we now had the writings of the Arians, we should not probably, uh, we should not probably find uh, softer things related by them of the Orthodox than the Orthodox in their writings relate to the Arians. But by reason of the severe edicts against keeping their books, their works are entirely destroyed, and we have now no remains of the history of those times but what we find in the writings of the Orthodox. And though these were in some respects great men, yet their actions and writings abundantly testify that they were far from being free from human passions, far free from hatred, from anger and the study of revenge, especially when they had to do with their adversaries and those who differed from them in matters of religion. This hath been the unhappiness of old times, that is too generally true of divines, what Erasmus, the chief, uh, the, the grief, with grief declared of the divines of his own, that the behavior of some, uh, uh, some of them is such that they have brought a reproach on this most holy study itself, since those who have attained to the height of this profession are sometimes more fierce than the laity, more ambitious, easier provoked, more virulent with their tongues, and more unfit for all manner of converse in life, not only than unlearned persons, but than they themselves would otherwise be. So that some have imagined that the very study of divinity hath made them such, or, as he elsewhere says, that their behavior is such, that divinity hath been, uh, hath been looked on as a sort of study that deprives men of sincerity and common sense. Now let us not imagine that these things are not equally true of the ancient as well as of the modern divines. He that but dips into the acts of the ancient councils and ecclesiastical remains will evidently see that they had the same passions with those of our, uh, of our own time, <coughs> were equally pre precipitant in condemning, bitter in reproaching and violent in persecuting those they called heretics. Yeah, you know, other believers have always been called heretics. I mean, I, I, I don't call, yeah, I think I called in the past also Catholics heretics. <laughs> uh, just just unbelievers, heathen, heathen. Uh, yeah, people who just don't believe. So one side calls the other heretics and um, that goes back and forth. Always depends on your point of view. And the only point of view that you can have in this regard is the point from the Bible. Eh? Now Socrates, that is the other historian that we read already in chapter 1 about, uh, volume 1, writes of the bishops of his own time, quote, that their manner was, to load with reproaches and pronounce impious all they deposed without declaring uh, the causes of their impiety. When they write against their adversaries, their style is oftentimes bitter, an impotency of mind that many have observed in the principal and most celebrated authors. Erasmus, who uh, though he highly commands Jerome, has several times observed the same in him. In his apology to Martin Dorpius, 
He thus writes of him, quote, Even Jerome, a man so grave and pious, could not always govern himself. He grows furiously hot against Vigilantius, immorality insults Jovinian, and bitterly inveighs against Rufinus. In his apology against Sutor, he goes farther and says, quote, that though his memory is now deservedly accounted sacred by all, yet whilst he lived he reviled and railed at by others. Hutter gives no, uh, gives no better a character of Jerome, writing against the Iren Irenicum of Piraeus. On page 14, he that turns over the writings of St. Jerome against Jovinian, Vigilantius and Rufinus will be amazed to see in a monk such a boiling and bitter gall. Upon which account Budaeus pleasantly writes to Erasmus, who knows but, what, but that for this reason he may be brought and scorched before the tribunal of Christ? I don't mention these things to blacken the reputation of Jerome, but to show by the example of this otherwise great man how difficult it is to govern oneself in theological debates when we see men famous of their piety thus carried away by the heat of disputes. With moderation of or the moderation of Austin is generally commanded. But he that reads his writings against the Donatists must acknowledge that in the warmth of disputation he oftentimes exceeds the bounds of moderation and lays to their charge everything that came uppermost. Athanasius's epistle to the monks is proof enough of this of his ungovernable and angry temper in which we find nothing but foul and reproachful language against the Arians a plain proof of a violently disordered mind. I question not, but that he had weighty reasons for his anger and hatred. But it is certain that when the mind is disordered, though for the most just cause many things are rashly thrown out, the effect of choler and not agreeable to truth, so that it is so that it is by no means safe hastily to credit all that the um, all that the angry fathers have said of or imputed to their adversaries, especially as they have taken care to suppress their writings. Cuneus very solidly and gravely pronounces his opinion of the Greek fathers, meaning the common people think uh, this is a quote now. The common people think that he must be very criminal who doth not believe that piety, that great support of Christianity, is always attended with candor. For my own part, as I esteem them of any accounts to be excellent and divine and divine men, so I know that they have done ill, design, uh, that they have done ill uh, designedly and were of a very bitter spirit. Now, to mention others, the Greek fathers, through a national vice, were always too violent on both sides. They had all of them a rolling eloquence, admirable learning, and a genius fit for everything, and on these accounts one may discern the sharpness and eagerness breathing throughout all the remains they have transmitted to prosperity. As for those they were angry with, though great men in themselves, and worthy the highest con uh, commendation, they blackened them as the vilest persons, and on the other hand they were so lavish of their praises on those they approved, that though they had little to deserve it, posterity admires their virtues, and even adores a stone of their sepulchre as a god." Unquote. Not much different from this is that passage of Melchior Canus in his Commonplaces of Divinity. I cannot excuse Sosomin's lays, for he was a Greek, with uh, which nation is and ever was addicted to lying. <laughs> he was a Greek, which nation is and ever was addicted to lying. Yeah. 
and he was so fully convinced that the most shameful lies had crept into the histories of his own church that he breaks out into this complaint. Quote, I speak it rather with grief than as a matter of reproach that L uh, Lartius hath written the lives of the philosophers with greater regard to truth than Christians have the lives of their saints, and that Suetonius' account of the Caesars is written with greater incorruptness and integrity than the account which the Catholics have given. I will not say of their emperors, but of their martyrs, virgins and confessors. The two former have not concealed the veal uh, have not con the two formers oh, where am I here the two former have not concealed the real or suspected vices of their best philosophers or princes, nor the appearance of virtue in the worst, whereas ours, for the most part, either are governed by their passions or industri industriously forge so many idle stories that I am not only ashamed but tired of them such as there are so far from being useful to the Church of Christ that they are greatly diverse uh, that they greatly uh, de deserve its interest. I forbear their names because here I blame their morals and not their learning as to which the, cens uh, the censure might be more free. As to behavior one ought to be more cautious toward the living and more respectful towards the dead. But this is certain, that whoever mix fable and falsehood with ecclesiastical history can't be good and upright man, and their whole account can be invented for no other purpose but to increase their gains or to establish error, of which the first is vile, and the other pernicious. Unquote. And a little after describing the office of a good historian, he says quote, that he ought not to dare to say anything false or omit anything true, that there may not be the suspected to write either out of the favour of hatred. He adds, since these things are necessary marks of honesty and integrity, it is strange that Suetonius should have observed them all, and almost all ours, uh, all ours have entirely omitted them. Unquote. Tis no difficult matter to conjecture what the candor and fidelity is in relating the actions of their adversaries and those whom they have condemned for heretics, who have been so immoderate and false in their commendations to, of the saints. Canus himself confesses that most of their writers have been destitute of every qualification of a good historian. Bellarmine, in his marks of the church, says, uh, you know, Cardinal Bellarmine, who supported uh, the futurist idea of um, of um, Ribera, Francisco Ribera from 1591. We are talking about this Cardinal Bellarmine here, the father of the uh, uh, why don't I come to that word right now? Liberation theology. <laughs> Sometimes the words are on the top of my tongue and they just don't come out. Yeah? The father of liberation theology, Bellarmine. In his marks of the church, so he's a, he's a Jesuit even. Yeah? In his marks of the church says, quote, The Catholics are nowhere found to have praised or approved either the doctrine or all life of the heathens or heretics. Unquote so that it was a sufficient reason to write the worst things of any man or to conceal and condemn to eternal oblivion the best and most laudable actions if he had been pronounced an heretic by the church and the papists now think it reason enough to give no credit to any person if he doth not condemn or if he praises the actions of those who have been declared heretics by the church of Rome and hath in any manner opposed her. On this principle, Melchior Canus gives his reasons why all the faithful of Christ ought to explode the 
history of Cario. For, says he, in his writings he vilifies and cruelly cruelly uses some of the popes who were the best of men well, I have my doubts on that and commands and extols some of the German emperors who were rebels and enemies to the Church of Rome so that you may know the lion by his paw i.e. a Lutheran by those he praises or condemns in his inference of Canus we're if this inference of Canus were true, it is necessary that he who would be owned for a Catholic must load all the enemies of the Church of Rome with infamy and disgrace, and never blame the Catholics but praise and command everything they do. <laughs> That's what they do today. But if we read the writings and histories of the modern papists, we shall find them filled with so many stories and evident lies to which the public acts and documents bear witness, that one can fierce find, them, find the smallest footsteps of truth in them, and may justly affirm that they wrote entirely for gain or the establishment of error. And if their power should rise again to the same height as it was in the former ages, the Dark Ages, so that they should be able wholly to destroy the writings and monuments of those who differ from them, and persons were to learn from their writings only the doctrines and actions of the Reformed and Protestant, who doth not see what wretched accounts they would transmit to posterity, even lighter than vanity itself which, however, could scarce be convicted of falsehood by proper testimonies after they had thus destroyed the contrary documents. And therefore, as it is not safe to form a judgment of the principles and behavior of the Reformed and Protestant from Popish writings only, so we ought to be very cautious and backward of pronouncing concerning the doctrines and actions of those who were condemned for heretics, from the writings and histories of the ancients, because their writings have been so entirely suppressed by the industry and care of their adversaries, that there is scarce one genuine book of, their remain, of theirs remaining, wherein they have described or defended their doctrine or manner of proceeding. But it is time to return from this discretion. We have shown with what bitterness the Orthodox have persecuted the Arians and uh, the Donatists. Nor did the Arians exercise less cruelty against the Orthodox when they had an emperor who favored their party. But it must be confessed, this cruelty was not always equal. For although the Arians are not to be excused in their barbarous test treatment of the Orthodox, Yet we read that sometimes it was greatly abated. Socrates, in his, in his ecclesiastical history, uh, in line 32, I can't read this reference here well, so check that out for yourselves, but Socrates, in his ecclesiastical history work, relates of Valens, the emperor, quote, that he violently opposed those who professed the doctrine of consubstantiality, threatening them every day with severer punishments, till Themistius, the philosopher, partly uh, mitigated his rage by an oration called, ah, uh, this is a Greek word or Hebraic word, I can't, I can't read that, in which he admonishes the emperor that he should not so greatly wonder that there was such a diversity of opinions between uh, amongst Christians, for that it, it was but small if compared with the number of the different opinions amongst the Greeks, which were more than the 300. This variety of opinions must necessarily cause divisions, but that God was pleased but that God was pleased with this diversity of sentiments, that all might learn the more to reverence his majesty from the difficulty of understanding him. 
when the philosophers had represented these and other things of like nature to him, the emperor grew afterwards more mild, though he did not entirely lay aside his fury, punishing the priests with banishment instead of death. But afterwards, as the same Socrates relates on uh, Chifre 35, being pressed with a Gothic war, he left off banishing the Homotians. Farther, there were some amongst them who obtained from all violence in matters of religion. Now, that is good news for once. There were some amongst them who abstained from all violence in matters of religion. That's how we all should be. <coughs> you know, we should all abstain from violence in matters of religion. Uh, in, in, in any matter, anyway. But surely in matters of religion. There cannot be a persecution of somebody only because of the reason of, of a difference in belief. Father, there were some amongst them who abstained from all violence in matters of religion and were willing to allow the free exercise of it to those who differed from them. Oh, that's freedom, huh? That's freedom of religion. Grotius gives them this testimony, quote, Nor is this a little to their praise, that the Vandals, about the time of Funeric and Gudemont, and the Goths, always abst uh, abstained from offering violence to the consciences of those subject to them, and permitted the followers of the Nicene faith to believe and teach and perform divine worship as they pleased. The ambassadors of the Goths said to Belisarius that they never forced anyone with threatening to change his profession, nor hindered the Goths themselves from believing the Nicene faith, adding that the Goths did not show less reverence towards the sacred places than the Romans themselves. And a little farther on page 32, Theodoric, king of the Ostrogoths in Italy, and Italy, is highly extolled by Eunodius, Eunodius, the Catholic bishop of Ticinium, of Ticinum, for his piety and worship of the true God. Such was his regard, even to the religion he did not profess, that he always made the best men bishop. Concerning which his nephew Athaleric, Athaleric thus writes, quote, it was but just to obey the will of so good a prince, who in a religion he did not believe, acted with so wise deliberation as to choose such a bishop as made it appear that it was his governing desire to see the religion of all churches flourish under good priests." Unquote. Hence it came to pass that he called a synod to put an end to a schism that had arose, as Paulus Warnefredi and Zonaras declare, quote, he annulled all simoniacal ordinations, so meaning um, when someone buys a clerical office, that's simony, so simon, simoniacal ordinations were annulled, and desired the Catholic bishops to pray in his, on his, in his behalf for the divine assistance, as may be seen in Cassidorus. So that I do not wonder that Silverius, Catholic bishop of Rome, was suspected by the Greeks of favoring the empire of the Goths rather than the Greeks. Procopius furnishes us with this noble instance of the equity of the Goths in religion. Unquote. Now, in like manner, the Orthodox emperors did not always make use of that severity which their laws threatened against heretics, it being sometimes their intention only to terrify with the fear of punishments. Huh? It was sometimes their intention to be some, uh, sometimes their intention only to terrify with the fear of punishments and not to inflict the punishment themselves. Sozomen relates that, quote, Theodosius commanded by a law that heretics should not assemble together, nor teach their opinions, nor ordain bishops or others, that some of them should be driven from their cities and lands. 
others declared infamous and denied the privileges of the city which others which other citizens enjoyed, and that he ordained other grievous penalties by his laws, which he never executed. For he endeavored not to punish, but to terrify his subjects, and thus to bring them into his own sentiments of the deity. For he commanded those who were willingly converted. The same writer relates of Valentian, who enjoys the empire with this brother with his brother Valens. For there's another quote here. There were both Christians by religion, but differed in their opinions and manners. For Valens, when baptized by Eodoxius, the bishop, furiously followed the doctrine of Arius, and was angry that he could not force all into his sentiments. But Valentinian embraced the Nicene faith and favored those who were of his mind, but never injured any who were of a different opinion. Unquote. Now, this little sentence, I have to make a little comment now. Um, you see the schism between the ones of the Nicene faith, which is the basis of Roman Catholics even today in 2017, and the Arians that were... Um, working here uh, is the Nicene faith. The Nicene faith is the establishment of the Trinity. So the Arians did not accept the Trinity as did the um, as did the, uh, the Catholics or the so-called Orthodox here, the ones of the Nicene faith. The Nicene faith is accepting the Roman Catholic Trinity and the Arians did not accept that. So, Socrates also and Sosomon relate of Gratian, who governed the empire with Valentinian, Valentinian the Younger, that he ordained by law, quote, that all persons, every religion without exception, without exception, should meet in their churches, and that the Eunomians, Photinians, and Manichees only should be expelled from them. Socrates after having recounted the various sects of heretics, adds, quote, that the emperor Theodosius persecuted none of them except Ionomius, whom for gathering assemblies and reading over the books he had written in private houses at Constantinople he sent into banishment, because he corrupted many with his doctrine. As to the rest, he offered them no injuries, nor forced them to communicate with himself but permitted all to meet in their conventicles and to think that they pleased of the Christ, uh, and, and to think as they pleased of the christian faith quote unquote christian faith one must say of course some of them be suffered to build themselves orator, uh, oratories without the cities but the novations to have their churches within them without fear because they held the same sentiments in matters of faith with themselves. And he relates of Atticus, bishop of Constantinople, quote, that he did not only preserve his own people in the faith, but even surprised the very heretics by his wonderful prudence, that he had no indication to persecute them, and that having once attempted to terrify them, he always be shrewd, he always after showed himself more mild and gentle towards them." Unquote. Now we have reached on the bottom of page 23, chapter 5, the opinion of some of the fathers concerning the persecution of dissenters, but as you've probably seen, this is very hard to read and I cannot keep up my concentration to do this right now, so I will stop here. And uh, we will continue next time on uh, War on Disinformation, Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth, with the reading of the book History of the Inquisition by Philip van Limborg in Chapter 5 of Volume 2 that we just read. And uh, until next time then, Jogla 66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross, for our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. 
Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. Your God's enemy without the cross, reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.